folks. Believe it or not, we're at the halfway point. Amen. Studying Torah for the Holy Land of Israel. The weaponry of the Jewish people. What do we have in our arsenal? The Torah. We have the Torah. Exactly. When CNN came in 1992 to Lubavitcher Rebbe by dollars and asked, what is your message for the world? So he said, Mashiach is ready to come, and all we have to do is increase in goodness and kindness. We have to do another mitzvah. We're at a time, at a crossroads, at a threshold, where the Jewish people could be headed into difficult times in the Holy Land. And therefore we need to learn, to take from our arsenal, learning that should be translated into deeds, into mitzvahs, the goodness and kindness. Through that, hopefully, that any thoughts that enemies of the Jewish people, or truth is any enemies of any decent-minded individual, that their plans should be annihilated, and that they should be transformed themselves, and to recognize that goodness and kindness, doing another mitzvah, is the answer to all the woes of the world. For our next speaker, Rabbi Yisrael Bernath, will speak about competing values in the Jewish arsenal. Wisdom, knowledge, versus prayer. If knowledge is power, then what's the value of prayer? One of the other ingredients that we have in our arsenal to fight a battle against negativity, against evil, against darkness. So, Rabbi Bernat, please share with us, please, the question. If knowledge is power, why indeed do we need to pray? Thank you. So you're having fun? Ready for more? So uh, we'll ask a few questions, some difficult ones that are hard to answer. Then we'll go back and forth a little bit, as rabbis like to do. And then hopefully by the end of 45 minutes to an hour, we'll have some answers. And if not, well, there's questions for that. Let's begin with a story. The story told of the Baal Shem Tov. He had a student, a wealthy man. He was actually one of the wealthiest men of his time. And being that he was a person of means, he used to travel to the Baal Shem Tov quite often. At one particular visit, the Baal Shem Tov said to him, on your way back home, I want you to pass through a specific town, and in this town, there lives a student of mine, a friend. His name is Bear. I want you to sell, seek out his well-being on my behalf. Oh, the wealthy man was excited. A personal mission for me from the Baal Shem Tov? He quickly told his driver to saddle the horses. They must go to this town immediately. They traveled for many days until they came to this town. Upon their arrival, the man thought, if it's a friend of the Baal Shem Tov, his name is probably not Bear, his, probably his name is the great Rabbi Bear. So he started asking around, excuse me, have you seen the great Rabbi Bear? What's the name of the Rabbi here? There's no Rabbi Bear. I'm looking for the great Rabbi Bear. He went from house to house, from person to person, until he had covered the entire town, and there was no sign of this Rabbi Bear. 
somewhat depressed, he got into the wagon and told the driver to go. As they were heading towards the outskirts of the city, they came across a small shack. He thought to himself, certainly there's no way that someone could live in this, in this hole. But he wanted to make sure that every home was turned before he left. And so he got out of the wagon and he knocked on the door. A young man answered the door. He said, excuse me, I'm looking for the great Rabbi Bear. I don't know about any great Rabbi Bear, but my name is Bear. Your name is Bear. I come from the Baal Shem Tov. You come from the Baal Shem Tov. You must be a guest in my home. Please come in. The man walks inside. He has to bend down to get in. The doorway is so small. He looks around and he sees the bare walls. The man's family was sleeping on some hay in the back on the floor. He sat him down in a chair. The chair could barely hold him up. And then... A few minutes later, he returned with a little bowl of soup, but it was very lukewarm with some chicken with a chicken bone in it. He tried to ignore his surroundings, and the whole night they spoke of the Baal Shem Tov, they spoke of his, his incredible miracles and the things that he had seen at the Baal Shem Tov. Towards morning, he gave him some hay to sleep on, but he was tossing and turning. He was thinking about his comfortable surroundings. In the morning, he gave him a little, a little bit of tea, and then he took him to the outskirts of the city, as was customary. Before they departed, the wealthy man turned to this bear and he said, How could you live like that? The bear smiled and said, How do you live? How do I live? I have this, this large home, I have comfortable surroundings, maids and servants, I have good food. I have comfortable beds. Thank God. He said, If that's so, how could you stand one night in my home? Obviously, it's not close to what you're accustomed to. The man said, Well, I'm on a business trip. And being on a business trip, I know that things won't be as comfortable as they are at home, but I can afford one or two or three nights without the comfort that I'm accustomed to. Bear smiled. And he said, me too. I'm also on a business trip. I'm on a business trip in this world. <laughs> and I will go through one or two or three or 70 or 80 years until I'll go to my home, to my lavish home, the way that I'm accustomed to. The story speaks for itself. The postscript, this bearer ended up becoming the successor of the Baal Shem Tov, the Maggid of Mizrich, the oh. Dov Bearer. But the story stirs something in our soul. Why? Who are we? What are we doing here? And why here? And what's the purpose? The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe says something very simplistic, yet profound. He says there are three souls within each individual, within each Jew. Soul number one, the instinctual soul, known as the Nefesh Bahami, the animal. It's no different than an animal. An animal wants to eat, it eats. The animal wants to sleep, it sleeps. Whatever the animal does, it's entirely instinctual. And a human being could live in accordance with their nature and be entirely instinctual their entire life. It's very simple. You wake up in the morning, you go to work, you come back, watch some TV, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, go to work, come back. There's nothing, there's nothing unique about that. That is instinctual. 
a little higher level than an animal, but it's still an animal. And then there's a second soul. It's called the intellectual soul. The nefesh hasichli, as it's referred to. This intellectual soul is the ability to decipher physical things. Nothing spiritual about it, just physical. But it's the ability to know that I like the chocolate chip cookie and I don't like the vanilla cookie. It's the ability to know that this scientist makes sense and that one doesn't. Or this philosopher makes sense and that one doesn't. So, there could be a person, and obviously this soul, this intellectual soul, is the difference between the animal and the human being. And so, someone can live their entire life tapping into this further soul, the soul that's not our nature, but further away, yet part of our existence, part of our being, and being able to be instinctual, yet sometimes think about it. Usually, when I buy, I'm impulsive. But sometimes, I think about it, and then I buy it. <laughs> and then there's a third soul. The third soul is the godly soul. It's the peace of God that he put within us, called Nefesh Elokit. And what this is, is this soul is entirely spiritual. But there's a catch. The catch is that this soul is the furthest away from our nature. So, as hard as it is not to be impulsive when we buy that item, it's even harder to bring spirituality into that purchase. That, of course, doesn't apply to anyone here because we're all sitting no. here, so... <laughs> that would defeat the purpose. But this godly soul, if, even though it's further away, it's brought into our lives, what does it do? It creates godliness within the other two souls. Somewhat it overtakes the other two in the right circumstance, in the right context. So now, let's go into our subject. There's prayer and there's Torah study. Torah study. The previous rabbi says that the study of Torah is done in order for one to do a mitzvah. That's the purpose of studying Torah. That study brings to action. This world is the world of Asiya, of action. So anything that we do, or anything that we study, must lead us to action. And that's why we study Torah, to know how to do a mitzvah. And then we have prayer. What's the purpose of prayer? Prayer allows us to cleave to God, to connect to God. So let's put it down into simple terms. We have a mind and we have a heart. Prayer taps into our heart, while Torah taps into our mind. I think a lot of, very often we, we have a difficulty with this heart and mind thing. And we think that when we bought something impulsively it was actually intellectual, or when we thought something through it was really impulsive. We don't, there's a very big difference. There's no heart in the mind, there's no mind in the heart, and it's, we have a very difficult time differentiating the two. The Torah differentiates it very simply and says, prayer, study. Now look at all the subcategories and see how that works. So, within Torah, there are three levels. There are three commandments. The first one, it says like this. We have a commandment to pray to God day, day and night. Sorry, pray to, to study day and night. To study assiduously day and night. That's our commandment. The second is a commandment to study and understand the text. Pretty basic. And there's the third. What's the third? Studying. And then when we're not studying the Torah, to apply the logic of the Torah to our daily life. 
Because the Torah is comprised of a logic, a certain series of events, a certain series, a systematic structure for understanding how to think. If we can tap into that and apply it to our life, unbelievable success. That's the secret. Don't listen to all those guys out there. Hmm? If we can take the logic and apply it to our lives, that means even when we're not studying the Torah, take everything we studied here today and then go out and apply that to our life and make it part of ourselves, internalize it, we will, that's, a, that's success. That's, that's the third aspect of Torah. <coughs> then we have three parts of prayer. We have a simple obligation that God said that when you are in need, this is the Torah says, when you are in need, pray to God. That's it. Okay, that's nice. Okay, how often am I in need? Well, I mean, all the time, right? But, let me pray to God. Come on, my grandmother does that. She does it enough that it, she has me in mind too. That's, that, that's a grandma's job. Well, why, why should we pray? Who needs to pray? Okay, fine. I'm in need. The Torah says pray to God. What? I'm not, I'm not uh, going to overdo it. I don't want to bother God every day. Once a week. I think that's enough. Twice a week. Maybe. Yes, Maimonides says, in the opening piece to his laws of prayer, that God wants us to pray every single day. So that's number one. Number one in prayer is praying every day and praying to God. Number two is understanding the prayer. It's very easy to make the prayer an absent-minded recitation. You walk over, you see, look in the shul, and you see this guy going, blah, 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 blah. and then you will go over to him and say, what are you saying? <laughs> so number two, we've got to understand what we're saying. And number three is what's called vidui tfila. It means that prayer is in lieu of the sacrifices in the holy temple. And because there's no holy temple today, prayer is somewhat... With a better, without a better source of words, somewhat of an atonement. Not the way other people define it, but an atonement. So now, let's understand what prayer consists of. What do we need it for? And why do we say it? And even further, which I think is the most difficult question, is why the same thing every day? Why the same words? It's kind of like a joke. God's sitting up there. I know what you're going to say next. <laughs> I, said. I know what's happening next. <laughs> Why the same words? What do we get out of those words Hope. that's so important? Hope. <laughs> Why can't I just finish my meal and say, Rub it up, dog. Thanks for the grub. Yay, God. <laughs> That's my own words. That's the way I like to speak to God. We have a relationship, you know. It's a little more informal. Why do I have to say the same words every day? Uniformity with everybody else. If everybody says their own, there's no... <laughs> Uniformity. Everyone's saying the same thing. That's, that's, that's a very good answer. Any other ideas? It's God's language, but sometimes, I mean, God understands every language. So, even if I'm saying the same words in English, it's still the same words every day. Same hope. They were so good, why change them? <laughs> they were so good, why change them? Exactly. <laughs> they were. That's actually partially the answer. Well, if you allow an outrageous question, it's an outrage. 
it's an outrage to be doing this prayer repeatedly. It's not admitted at all. It's an outrage against God. It's not for something he's disgusted with. Why do you think it's an outrage against God or something disgusting? Because just what you said, he has to listen to this babble going on with people not any concern about what they're saying. They're saying it, you know, it's, it's a right thing to say. They've been brainwashed, therefore they're thrown back into the animal soul, actually. They're not in the high soul, but the animal soul. It's interesting, that you're, it's interesting that you're saying that, that, that the people have been brainwashed and they've been thrown back. Let's, let's understand. Okay, I want to take one prayer that we say every day, three times a day, and let's analyze it and try to understand what this prayer is doing here, where it comes from, and why we say it. And my hope is by understanding this prayer, perhaps the next time we say it, we say it with a little more enthusiasm and a little more excitement. And it's the prayer of Elena Lushabeach, the last prayer of the service. What's the story? Where did that prayer come from? Actually, this prayer is the oldest prayer that's not documented in the Torah. The story goes like this. God told Joshua, the Jewish people are going to enter the land of Canaan and defeat all the nations who are living there and take it over and make it their own land. And so they come all excited, geared up with their pots and pans and rakes and spoons, everything that they had to fight. They had some other stuff also. And they're ready to take over the land of Canaan. They come to the first city, the city of Jericho. There's a fortified wall all around the city. There's no hope. <laughs> the people in Jericho are sitting there laughing. Okay, let's see what you're going to do. There's, there's, there's nothing happening here. So Joshua composes a prayer. A lenu he says. God tells him, I'm going to make a miracle. I want the Jewish people to circle around the city of Jericho for seven days, once each day. On the seventh day, circle around the city seven times. Blow the shofar three times, and miraculously the wall will fall down. What a sight, huh? And that's what happened. The Jewish people circled around once every day for seven days. On the seventh day, seven times, blew the show for three times, the wall collapsed, the people fled. It was an open miracle. That's the Lenu Shabbat. A thousand years later, there was a sage, his name was Rav, and he created what we call today the Machzor, that we use in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. He found this prayer, and he put it into the Rosh Hashanah service, into the section of Malchiot. And he says there that if God made miracles then, God can make miracles now. Let's use this prayer. This is a prayer of miracles. The next time that I found this prayer has been mentioned, the year 1171, city Law, France. There is a group of 17 men and women who were involved in some sort of libel. They were sentenced to be burned at the stake. The churchman told the rabbi of the, na of the neighboring city, his name was Ephraim of Bon, who told Rabbi Yaakov of Orleans, who wrote it in his book, that the people sang their dying tomb of Elena Lushaber. And he asked there, why? Why would the people not say the Shema Yisrael? That's the testament of our faith of God. And he says like this, if you look at the Shema in the Torah, you'll see there are two letters that are larger than the rest. There's an ayin and a dalid. Together they spell the word eight, which means a testimony. When we say the Shema, 
It's a testimony to God's existence. If you look at the Elenu prayer, the first letter is an ayin, and the last letter is a dalit. Again, it's an aid, it's a testimony to God's existence. It's a testimony to God. This is the Elenu prayer. The next episode, somewhere in the early 1400s, there was a Jew living in Rome. His name was Pesach Peter. He was an apostate Jew. He had converted to Christianity. And he decided to show loyalty to the church. So he asked for a meeting with the Pope. When he arrived, he asked the Pope, tell me, I want to tell you about a prayer the Jewish people pray. It's called the prayer of Eleni Lushabeach. The Pope said, tell me about this prayer. He said, in this prayer, they have a verse. And it says like this, Shehem Mishtachavim Leheva Vilarik, that they bow to vanity and nothingness. Do you know, dear Pope, who they were, who they're referring to? And Jews have this thing called gematria. It's called every letter in the Torah has a numerical equivalent. So if you add up the numerical equivalent of Leheva Vilarik, it adds up to the same numerical equivalent as Yeshu U Muhammad. That when they say when they say that they're bowing to vanity and nothingness, what's vanity and nothingness? J.C. and Muhammad. He was off by 36. <laughs> nice try. But the Pope didn't know this. And so he issued an edict that read that this line should be etched out of all prayer books. And this Pesach Peter went on to say, you want proof? The next verse in the Elenu prayer says, it's a verse from Isaiah, they pray to a God who cannot save. Which religion talks about God saving? You see, they're talking about us. And so, the Pope issued the edict that said that this entire line, the has to be taken out of every prayer book. And they did. They etched it out of every single prayer book from Amsterdam all the way down to France. Every prayer book was, it, it was gone. And if you look actually in the European, the Ashkenazi prayer book to this day, only recently has it, has it been put in, but until about 60 years ago, it was still missing from the prayer book. In the prayer book that I, that I use, which is the, the Arizal, the one that the Alter Rebbe, the, the first Hasidic, Chabad Hasidic Rebbe created, he only put half of it. He put, uh, he put Lahav Vilarik back in. This is the story of Elenu. We can go on and on and talk about some of the incredible pieces. And so, when the men of the Great Assembly, when the Asheh Knesset Sagadola, were creating the prayer book that we use today, they put it at the end. And they said at the end of your prayer, when you think you want to run home or run out into the world, when you want to go do whatever you do, and you think that Judaism is in the synagogue, but when I go out, I can do whatever I want. Remember, remember this prayer. Remember that you're different. Remember that you have a soul. Remember who you are. This is your prayer. And remember that this prayer has made miracles. Ask for miracles in your life. When it's all over and there's no hope left, ask for miracles. And so we use prayers that have been tested and proven. It worked once, a better chance it's going to work again. So I can say my own prayer. But if I say this prayer with fervor, with attunement, and with a heartfelt dedication to God, 
the same way Joshua said it, it's possible that God can make a miracle in my life too. And a miracle so open as the falling of the city of Jericho. No, three times, just three times. Oh, oh, on the seventh day, seventh time. I don't know why God told him that was part of the miracle. Something else. Sometimes we have to take the story, especially the story, a story of Joshua, a story of the Torah, at face value. This is this was the miracle. This is how God wanted the miracle to work within nature, because everything God does is ultimately within nature. The Midrash says that when God split the sea of reeds, every single body of water in the world at that time split. Because God doesn't make a miracle outside of nature. And so too with many other miracles. And read about the Torah, those, many of them, with few exceptions, were done within nature. So we talk about prayer. And we understand now, a little glimpse. Obviously we can go through each prayer and talk about their story. Each one has an incredible story. And each one has a reason why it's in the place that it's in. And I think that it's imperative that someone who's praying and praying every day to study this and to learn the meanings and to understand why we pray, where it comes from, because every single one has an incredible story. So why pray the same thing every day? I think it makes a little more sense now. We pray it because every day is new. Every morning, our soul wakes up invigorated, ready to conquer the day, ready to take it over. The Rebbe quotes his father-in-law in Hayom Yom and says that a summer day and a winter night is a year. Every day, God gives us a new day to make a difference, to make a change. And at the end of the day, when we recalculate that day, we hope that we've used that day to the best of our ability. I'd like to share a personal story with you. But eight years ago, ten years ago actually, ten years ago, I was teaching a young boy in Minneapolis. I was living there at the time. And we used to study every day, this nine-year-old boy and I, we, we, we developed a very close relationship and a strong bond. I moved away and went to a different school, but I still kept up with him about once a week. We spoke, we studied on the phone. One day, I get a phone call. This young boy was hit by a truck. He was in a coma in the hospital. I didn't think twice. I went out. I was then in New Jersey, I flew to Minnesota, and I took all my books, and I parked in the hospital room. They weren't moving me. I stayed there for two and a half weeks. Throughout that time, I thought, the Rebbe always said that if you find yourself in a situation, there's a reason. There's a reason why a soul needs to be in a specific situation at a specific time. So I got a list of all the Jewish patients every morning. And after I prayed in the morning, I would go around to different rooms and visit the patients. One morning, the, stories, the episode is very faint in my mind, but I could bring it back. One morning, I walked into a room sides. One side there was an empty bed with three towels on it. On the other side there was a young girl laying there and a woman a little older with their hands down on the bed and their head down on the bed crying. I made some noise with my foot to wake her up. She looks up at me and she says, Rabbi, pray for my daughter. 
She's all that I have left. My husband just passed away from the sea. And here my daughter, my only child, has the same thing. I'm going to be alone. Please, you must pray for her. So I said that God has a very special place in his heart for the prayers of Jewish mothers. I know they work. So we sat down and started saying some psalms, some Tehillim. I gave her my Tehillim that had an English translation. And I said, you say these, you say these prayers. And of course took down the name and wrote it into to, to the gravesite of the Lubavitch Rebbe in the year. Two weeks passed. 14 months passed, and unfortunately, the young boy passed away. Three years passed, and I found myself in Sydney, Australia. I'm walking down the street in Sydney, center of a town called Martin Place, and I hear two women just speaking what we used to call in Sydney American. quickly turned to the corner. I said, welcome to Oslo, I'm I. Where are you from? Minneapolis. Where are you from? Oh, Minneapolis. So she looks at me, she says, I know you. I said, come on, you put some, a hat and a beard on somebody. <laughs> they all look the same, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I know you. She reaches into her purse. And she pulls out that book that I had given her. Totally forgotten about. She says, Rabbi, I want to tell you what happened. I use this book every day. I still use this book. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. Every single day, every moment, I prayed from the deepest bottom part of my heart, I prayed. And here we are, Three years later, we took a vacation to Sydney to celebrate her full recovery. And look who you meet. From Minneapolis to Sydney, what are the chances? That it was a Friday afternoon, and that night we used to make an event called Studio Central, where we would bring a lot of the young, uh, young people in Sydney, young Jews, religious, non-religious, to meet together, hopefully, make some matches. Matchmaker, matchmaker. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, I said to her, you have to come. No, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, yeah, la, la, la. We're not religious. I said, good, no one else is either. You'll be perfect. <laughs> so, back and forth, we spoke for a while. They said, okay, Rabbi, we'll meet you there, but you'll take us around, right? Yeah, sure, don't worry. I'll just introduce you to everybody. We'll help us. That night they came and introduced them. I had, I, I had left, about, I left about 1 a.m. and they were still, they were still there. I looked, I, I, I forgot about that episode. I was talking about two years ago. I was talking to a friend of mine. He says, you know, remember in the, in the synagogue over there, there was a boy who had a very rare disease, and when he, he recovered from it, and he was fine, he was in remission, but one of the sides of his face was sad. Yeah, 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 I remember that. He said, well, he got engaged today. Some girl from the States. I said, really? Was it by any chance? It's Melissa. I said, yeah, how do you know? And I told him this story. He said, the girl and her mother moved to Sydney, and they're still living there. personal story of prayer. We don't know. We don't understand. We're told, say the words of Psalm. Say the Psalms, they work. Just say the words. We don't know what they mean. We don't understand them. We know they work. We know of the power of prayer. 
There's another story of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was once in a specific, in a particular town, and the man was trying, was fumbling through the prayer book. He came over to him and said, Rabbi, you must know how to pray. Help me, teach me the prayers, what's when. I just, now I want to just say the whole prayer book every single day, and it's very time consuming. Please teach me, the, teach me the prayers. And so they sat down, and they put little notes and little markers into each part of the prayer book until they had covered the whole prayer book. And the Baal Shem Tov left. The man picked up the book, and as we say in Hebrew, Chok Shel Murphy, Murphy's Law. All the papers fell out. So he runs out of the synagogue. He's looking for the Baal Shem Tov, and he sees he's all the way in the back. So he runs as fast as he can after the rabbi. He sees the rabbi comes to the lake. He takes his handkerchief, he waves it in the air, he puts it out on the lake, he steps on it, and he rides across the lake. Okay. So he runs, he comes to the lake, he pulls out his handkerchief, he puts it down on the river, and steps on it, and he rides across. He finally catches up with the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov turns around and says, how did you get here? He said, what do you mean, how did I get here? He said, how did you get across the lake? He said, I don't know, I saw you put down, you waved it, and you put it down, and you went across, so I did the same thing, it went across. Baal Shem Tov looked at him and said, you don't need anything. Continue what you're doing. Continue what you're doing, Your Honor. God's looking after him. That's it. God's looking after him. And so I think that now, as we come together and we pray for Israel, and we study, and we use both the power of prayer and the power of study. This is our arsenal, as Rabbi Fine said. This is what we have. This is what we've always had. If you look throughout the generations, look at Jewish history, see what they've done. What have our grandparents and great-grandparents and all the generations back, what have they done? They have used their arsenal. They've used the power of prayer and the power of Torah. Sixty years ago, in Soviet Russia, in a cellar, in a cellar, in a cellar, in a cellar, people studied Torah, because that was the secret. Even as far back as our forefather Jacob, he knew he was going into Egypt. He had no choice. What did he do? He sent his son, Yehuda, ahead of him to do what? To establish, his, to establish the houses of study, so that right upon entering Egypt, they can continue their Torah study, because that's the secret. Even the, the Talmud talks about a time, an exile called Yechana, where the Jewish people were given three requests from the, the, the emperor. And one was to keep the leadership of the family of Rabban Gamliel. And the other one was to keep the prayers of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was known to have very powerful prayers. And the third one was to keep the yeshivas open. And you see right over there, there's two things. You have prayer and you have Torah study. And you have prayer for the heart and Torah for the mind and the mind and heart together in unity approaching the three souls because in order to take over the, the, the Hasidah says, the Tanya says that the, the, when the mind dominates the soul that is the key because we'll continue because the seat of the divine soul, the Nefesh key, the peace of God is in, our, is in our minds, while the seat of the animal within us is in the left ventricle of our heart, the way it pumps the blood. That's why when someone gets angry, you see they turn red in the face. As it pumps the blood, the left ventricle. That's how it fights with the divine soul. So when we're able to overpower our hearts and not take a step back, we want to say that thing. We want to buy that thing. We want to do it. No problem. Just take a step back. Think about it. Let your mind dominate your heart. Just think a second. 
That's all it takes is one moment. Don't do it impulsively. Don't let the heart prevail. And then we have both the power of study and the power of prayer. And our prayer today is that our brethren, our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel, there should be peace, there should be happiness. We should only know of joy. And the Jewish people should always be in a state of bliss and happiness and able to do as we are, to study, to use our arsenal, to study and to pray, to do as we do best. And may this be with the coming of the righteous Mashiach very soon in our days. Amen. Amen. Amen.